Everyone, can you hear me? I'm working without a microphone. You can tell my voice has been developed through 20 years in teaching secondary school children. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm just really delighted to be here. How could you miss Treasure Mountain? Um, I've been to many, many Treasure Mountains over the years, and they are my favourite, favourite part of actually coming to AASL. So I'm just delighted to be here. I'm going to give you a very fast presentation of 30 minutes and I want to uh, focus on how do we sustain the whole arena of learning commons, school libraries as learning commons. And I just want to point your thinking, this is a thinking session, about building the sustainable culture around uh, our school libraries as learning commons. How do we build and think forward, move forward for the future? You know, I've long actually believed that school libraries are learning commons. And in fact, David, you and I were in a session of brainstorming with the Ontario School Library Association many, many years ago. And collectively, we crafted this definition of a school library. And look at, the, this is now years old. And, and we talked about the school library as the schools, physical and virtual <coughs> learning commons. And I want to draw your attention to some of the core concepts that we articulated. Reading, inquiry, thinking, imagination, discovery and creativity play two important roles. Number one, the student's information to knowledge journey. Our school libraries are clearly situated in a curriculum milieu. And performing and enabling that information to knowledge journey as part of the curriculum is so central. But the second component to their personal, social and cultural growth it's not just about curriculum, it's about a value-added notion for living and learning and life beyond the walls of the school library. And so what I want to very, very briefly do today is to talk about what I see are some of the core dynamics or core ideas that we really have to come back to as we think of creating a sustainable culture and a sustainable future for the learning commons. And so, in this brief presentation, I'm going to touch on these uh, six or seven ideas. They're going to be very brief and very rapid, but I want to bring us back to what I think uh, Bill talked about last night. What are the core values? He posed that critical question. And so I want to come back to the culture of reading and literacy development. I want to briefly talk about social diversity, inclusion and justice. I want to come back to the central dimension of humanistic study and to build on some of the ideas in innovation, creativity and the customization of the personal spaces. So I want to very briefly touch each of these. But I want to come back, and I've actually not heard much conversation. I know that I haven't been in every session, so please forgive me if I am uh, a, a little incorrect in what I'm saying, but I'm just basing this on the conversation. Coming back to the culture of reading, across its multiple forms and in its multiple ways, I deeply believe the solid rock of the learning commons is a culture of reading across the forms, across the formats, across the context. But this culture of reading is so important. It is the solid foundation of school libraries and learning commons. If we don't have it, we don't have a learning commons. And I want to come back to the great rock of reading for school libraries, Professor Stephen Crasham. He is our intellectual rock and he worked so vigorously in his retirement to build school libraries on a culture of reading. 
Last night, Ned Hill talked about connecting heads and hands. He talked about experiential learning and the connecting heads bit has its foundation in a culture of reading. And you know, Stephen Krashen talks about free voluntary reading as the rock of literacy development, vocabulary, spelling, writing, comprehension, as the building block of self, identity, cultures and careers, and indeed the stepping stone between conversation and academic language. Now yesterday I heard a lot of talk around free range learning and the foundation of free range learning is free range reading, free voluntary reading. That's my first point. The second point comes back to this notion of social diversity, inclusion and justice. Our country and many countries have serious issues. One is poverty, major issue of poverty, major issue of access to resources. There is a lot of discussion around social justice, inclusion and diversity in library contexts. And I want to hear those core concepts because they are part of our value, part of our collective values. And I want to, when we even use the word commons, at the heart of the notion of commons for everyone, for all, is, is questions and enacting social justice, diversity and inclusion. And I want us to begin to think in the first instance, and I see these fabulous libraries, I think of those schools that barely have a hundred dollars for a budget for a library. And we've got to put that into the wider scenario. But I want us to think even more broadly as the learning commons as an affirmative action, not just for poverty in our communities, but for social diversity, inclusion and justice. And what do I mean by that? The place that provides equitable access to technology, to the diversity of devices, to the diversity of tools, to information in all of its forms, and to the services, the instructional service. It's about opportunity for all. And I think we've really got to celebrate that and promote that as part of our, our public speak about the libraries as learning commons. But it's not just about access to all of the, the resources. It's, it's access to ideas. And I'm going to pull that in, an, in a little more detail. But it's a place and, a, and space where students voluntarily can explore their own interests. It's about where they can pursue their own identity questions and identity crises, where they can do this without interruption. It's about self. It's about self-development. And, and that's a real serious question about how we enable the resourcing in our, in our learning commons. And, and last night we heard about identifying the range of learning styles the w different ways that so many of our kids learn. So our learning commons addresses diversity and equity issues through providing that individual mentoring, the connecting, the interacting in ways that they know best and learn best. In, in ways you, you give them the best experiences for their, their learning. And that means we've got to open our minds pedagogically and we've got to understand who these kids are and the way they think and the way they be and do and become. And the notion of the safe place is even more critical as kids explore questions about self, questions about their relationship to the world. And I want to come back to a core value, and that's humanistic study. 
who is at the core of our learning commons? It's not the space. It's not the making. It's the kids. And I just want us to really think, how does our learning space provide for the many faces of the people that we serve? How many faces can you see? How many faces do you see when those 35 kids pile into your, your, your library? It's coming back not to the maker space notion, but to the maker. And I want us to come right back to this question of humanistic study. Our learning commons, in essence, has to be the cradle of inspiration. It has to be the, it, you know, the, the humanistic notion of the cradle of civilization, the cradle of democratic cultures and society. And this, in essence, is the common of the commons. Let's think about it from a people perspective and not so much a resource perspective. And when we think about the diversity of people, we have to think about our commons as this breeding ground for ideas generation. We want to disrupt the thinking patterns. We want to disrupt the process of coming to know. We want our learning commons to be a breeding ground of intellectual discontent because out of that discontent we find ourselves, we discover our answers. So our learning commons comes right back to meeting the humanistic needs of individuals. It's the breeding grounds for critical thinking, argument, debate, building knowledge. I want to see our learning commons, commons centres for debate, De where kids develop their powers of observation and comprehension. That's the ideas common, and that's founded on free-range reading. Of course, the social commons is so critical. There's a lot of discourse and complex discourse around collaborative learning. But we have such rich opportunities for social, collaborative and informal learning. Remember in my definition I talked about the curriculum, but I talked about the other, the development of self. That's the larger uh, space in which we operate. And how do we provide those connections between the formal and the informal, the connections between the free-range reading and the curriculum and the sparking of ideas that, that uh, give kids the capacity to imagine, to think outside of the box and to create. That's the social commons. And then, of course, we are not disconnected from the rest of the world, the notion of the community commons. We have unbelievable opportunities to remove borders, remove obstacles. Community formation. And that's just not groups in the schools, that's building connections outside of the school library. One of my wonderful uh, colleagues who has taught for us at Rutgers, Grace Ann DeCandido, gives you something really to think about. If we want our learning commons to be a cesspool of ideas, to, to shake up our kids and their thinking because that's why we're there, she says, if librarianship is, connect, is the connecting of people to ideas, and I believe that is the truest definition of what we do, it is crucial to remember that we must keep and make available, not just good ideas and noble ideas, but bad ideas and silly ideas. And yes, even dangerous or wicked ideas. Isn't that food for thought? But if we begin to think of notions of inclusion and ideas explosion, the eruption of ideas, that's where we're at. And my wonderful, wonderful colleague, who I just love working with, Joyce Valenza, take a photo. You know, we are, our kids are living and learning in a digital culture. And there you go, Joyce. Oh my gosh, I just got born. 
you know, and I want to just shift the conversation to this notion of learning uh, spaces and, and, you know, our kids are growing up in this amazing digital environment. And, and I came across the work of two really interesting people and I'm just putting, putting them out there because one of the conversations that we've had over the last few days is how do we become that, that spark, that flame, that fire for imagination, creativity and, and um, innovation. Uh, Maurice de Greff from the Free University of Brussels talks about our, our spaces and our actions have to be a dance. Learning, whether it's formal or informal learning, is a dance. And it really challenges us in leading the learning commons to find the new dance moves. To understand, you know, for example, I think even the conversation around free range learning has yet to be unpacked in really rich and complex ways. How do we really critically engage with the adaptive technologies? But how do we do it in meaningful, reflective and personal ways that really foster the rich, out-of-the-box engagement with information? And that's really critically an educational role of the school librarian or learning communist or whatever you're calling yourselves these days. The rise of social learning. And, and so I just want to reflect a little bit in terms of the learning pathways and spaces. It is about creating that culture and framework for cre creativity and innovation. The question, what does the sky taste like, is such a fabulous question. And when you are going to sleep tonight after a great tiring day, I want you to ponder that question. What does the sky taste like? And then begin to think about how you might explore it. I, it just explodes my mind. But coming back to this notion of building the culture and framework for creativity and innovation, it's not just resourcing the curriculum. It's not just the informational texts. It's not just the, the, the fictional works. But it's about sourcing ideas. It's about sourcing ideas and having empathy for different ideas. And we really need powerful resources to inspire imagination. Databases can be terribly boring in my view. But, but resources for imagination that get kids questioning, that get kids thinking about innovation and problem solving. And I think we've got a real challenge in terms of curating the inspirational databases that are sparks of ideas. And I think we've got to come right back to the humanistic study, the critical engagement with ideas. The analysis, the synthesis, the argument, the knowledge construction and, and creation. I want us to think about living books. We, we're talking about community, we're talking about people. What about the living book? Connecting to people and community expertise. In other words, moving from collection development to connection uh, development, as somebody mentioned yesterday. But at the same time, if we want to foster creativity, if we want to foster that, that innovation, then part of our library, our learning commons culture, has to be design thinking. And, and I don't hear very much about that, and I'm putting this out. How do you give kids the thinking processes, free range as it is, in terms of crafting an idea observing, problematizing, brainstorming, solution generation, design mapping, prototyping, testing and redesigning, actioning and impacting. These are the kind of intellectual structures, these are the kinds of mind things that, were, that we heard last night. The mind and the action coming together. I've been thinking a lot about 
the notion of coding skills and that's absolutely part of this intellectual infrastructure. And I'm not just talking about computer coding, but giving kids opportunity to explore and develop the wide range of capabilities for problem solving, whether it's simply writing a procedural step, whether it's computer coding or machine coding for someone to follow. And I want to come back to what I think is the stalwart of our profession. A wonderful colleague, distinguished scholar, Carol Coulthor, and her work with her daughters around guided inquiry. In reality, she provides us with the design ecosystem for inquiry, for innovation, for creation and production. I loved yesterday that people focused on questions because innovation and creativity is born out of questions. And Professor Coulthor, my wonderful colleague, has in fact crafted one design process that I think is really critical. And I'm going to finish soon, David, truly. I just want to make some comments about maker spaces or hacker spaces or look at the labels we've got already. The hatch space, the maker commons, the creation stations, the lunch block clubs. I like the notion of the culture of creativity. And I come back to my earlier comment that yes, I hear the arguments about free range learning, but let's get back to the core foundation of free range reading as part of that. And, and I just think that that's part of the, the formal and informal learning processes, the inbox and the out of box uh, opportunities that we provide our students. But giving kids the, the, the intellectual and the intellectual framework for moving forward, for thinking and thinking outside of the box. And again last night, the notion of experiential learning is about connecting heads and hands. And let's not forget about the headspace. It's not the maker space, it's the maker. And sometimes I just wonder whether in this rich and exciting conversation around maker spaces, we're actually shifted the focus a little away from the maker. But it's, and you know, but it is about having a vision, the space, the time, the opportunity. It's about giving kids the opportunity for authentic design, design-based learning. One of the things that really worries me about maker spaces is, you know, are we going to be handing out screwdrivers instead of books? I know that sounds terribly naughty. But are we returning to the industrial age factory where libraries become hardware stores and tool shops? I want us to think very carefully about that. I'm, not, I, I'm quite serious in my statement. I, don't get me wrong, I love the focus and, and it's so timely that we focus on this innovation and creativity. But what's our vision? What's the mindset we're setting up to enable this to take place? And here is me as a researcher being particularly naughty. There is a lot of rhetoric and, and anecdotes around the makerspace movement. And it's time to move on from the anecdotes. I want, we have such an incredibly rich opportunity for looking at how makerspaces make makers. And I want to challenge this profession. How are we looking at the outcomes? I loved yesterday the statement where somebody said we've got statistically significant results that show our maker spaces has resulted in, in a larger borrowing and circulation rate. Perfectly fine, but let's begin to talk about what this does to kids. That's a good bit of statistic and I love it, don't get me wrong, about your space. But let's begin to explore how this is shaping our young people, focusing on the makers. How are we really creating makers and what is our contribution? Because I actually believe sometime down the track the crunch is going to come and people will want data. And the last point that I want to make, we are consumed by data. Whether we like it or not, our school environments are just the most amazing and in fact 
horrific scenarios for the accumulation and aggregation of vast quantities of data. There's huge quantities of data at an individual, social and educational level that our schools have to deal with. And part of sustaining our future is a data-driven capacity. And I want us to actually really carefully think in relation to my earlier spaces about maker spaces, our learning commons are data-driven ecosystems. And in some ways, charting our future means that we have to develop far richer capacity in data analytics. Data, learning outcomes data, literacy data, reading data, community data. And I actually am increasingly believing that data analytics is a core competency for the future of school library educators. It comes right back to what I've been talking about now for 15 years evidence-based practice. And again, Joyce gave you a fabulous presentation last night on some of the tools. You have to become data-centric, data-analytic-centric. That's core to the future of what you do. And at the same time, in this milieu of the learning commons, empowering students to recognise and understand their own data contribution and the critical awareness of its impacts. Data citizenship is part of your agenda, as it is part of kids' agenda. And of course that also means too that part of our resourcing of the tools and the capacity for data interrogation, questioning and analysis, because that's critical to the building of knowledge. And I must finish, in sum, when we talk about sustainable cultures for a sustainable future for learning commons, I want us to think about our spaces and our places and our actions as the cradle of civilization. I want us to think about our spaces as living ecosystems of formal and informal learning. I want us to seriously think about the data-driven evidence and actions. I want us to think about our learning commons, our school libraries, as centres for discovery, inquiry and knowledge production. And that means that in our thinking we move from a constructivist framework to a constructionist framework where we think very carefully what are the products, what are the outcomes of this process of construction and how do we sort that, that constructionist mindset is so critical as we think about our learning commons as these creative and innovative places. And more importantly, you do it tough and I value every bit that you people do. Your, your library is indeed a rock in a hard place. That's the learning commons. It is about adding value. And I can't finish up without saying just one more thing. My dear, dear colleague, David Lurcher. <laughs> I give grateful thanks. I'm done, David. That was brilliant.